Uh, let me read this background. We're going to study the weaker believer and the stronger believer. It's quite possible that we're going to be in this kind of situation very soon. Uh, in a new field, you're going to run into quite a few young baby believers who've not been taught well, and you're going to be challenged with your freedom. Because here in this semi-protected environment where many of us, we've not had a lot of influx recently, we've, we just have a lot of freedom with each other, and we all know each other, and so there's not a lot of challenge to your liberty. But that's going to change very soon. You know, we're going to find that there are going to be people that we don't know and don't know what they know and where they are in their spiritual life, whether they're immature, they're babies, whether they understand issues of freedom or not. And, and as the more mature, as Paul calls us, the stronger, we're responsible to care for the weaker. So let's, let's discuss that. In the, in the first century... The Roman Empire was littered with pagan religions and pagan temples. Many of these temples sacrificed animals during their worship, daily worship, cooked and even consumed the fresh meat as part of worship. These temples also served as larger, large facilities for social functions, uh, and it is believed that the freshly sacrificed meat was offered for sale to the public. This is pretty much the, the consensus of the background of these discussions. Before being saved, the people of ancient cities bought and ate the meat without questioning the right or wrong of doing so. Now, this is meat that's been sacrificed to a false god. After salvation, the immature believers, especially the Jewish believers, often considered eating meat that had been sacrificed to a pagan god or demon as sinful. The more mature believers had come to realize that an idol was nothing, and sacrificing an idol to nothing did nothing to ruin the meat. So it was fine with God to eat the meat. But a conflict arose between the weak believers, what Paul calls the weak believers, if you, while you listen to me, turn to Romans 14 right quick. We'll read a few things, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians 8. But there's a conflict with the, between especially those Jewish believers who had been taught not to eat meat sacrificed to idols and the strong believers who understood there was no issue. They understood Mark 15... Uh, I mean, that should be Matthew 15 and Mark 7, where Jesus said food enters the body. It doesn't enter the heart. goes through the stomach and is eliminated. He said it, it doesn't defile you. It's what's in your heart. It's what you put in your heart and what comes from your heart that defiles you. So Paul's going to deal with this issue because in Corinth, this was one of the questions they sent him. They sent him questions about marriage, and, and this was one of the issues they were struggling with. So in Romans 14, I'll get there right quick. You start to read that. You know, he talks about meat, the weaker believer. He says, the, now accept the one whose faith is who's weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his views. One man has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. Let not him who eats the meat regard with contempt to look down upon him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted both. Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Stand he will, for the Lord will make him stand. One man regards, see so here he deals with another issue, the, the issue of days. The Jews kept these days and these festivals. Listen, they, they, they'd been indoctrinated in, into the law their whole life, 2,000 years worth of tradition. It was difficult to let it go. Difficult. And so they brought it with them. Now go on down to the end of chapter 14. 
Uh, he said it in 21, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. And we're going to deal with the fact that your liberty, your freedom to do certain things that other churches consider sinful, but you know that it's not sinful if kept in a moderate place, can lead other believers to partake of these things when they, in their thoughts, their belief, they believe it's sin. And if your liberty, if you expose your liberty to them, they may be influenced to partake when they believe it's a sin. And guess what? It's a sin. You say, no, it's not a sin. If you believe it's a sin, and you, and even if it's not, listen to what Paul says. He says, verse 22, the faith which you have, in other words, if you believe it's wrong to eat meat sacrificed to idols, that's the faith that you have. Or you understand your faith says, no, it doesn't matter. The faith that you have, have is your <clears throat> own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Are you following this? You sure you're following this? So your liberty, the big, the big deal to, in our time is usually alcohol. So you know you having a, drinking a beer is not a sin. Drinking six beers probably is a sin. So, you know, I like what Ron says. You know, you don't, you don't get six Diet, Diet Dr. Peppers and drink them right in a row. I mean, who does that? But anyway, but if your neighbor goes to the Church of Christ and thinks drinking itself is a sin and sees you doing it, you do it in front of him, and he thinks, well, I think I'll do that with you. When he does it, believing it's wrong, for him, it's wrong. Why? Because in his heart, he's just obeyed, disobeyed God. Between him and God, he's disobeyed God. You follow that? So the point is, we got to take care of the babies. We got to take care of the babies. No more than you would tell your 12-year-old child private things that go on between a husband and wife. You wouldn't expose them to those things, nor would you do baby believers Expose them to your freedom. There's a responsibility that we who are mature have toward those that are not. So he says in verse 1, now accept the one who's, look in chapter 15, verse 1. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those who are not strong, not indulge ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his own good, to edify him, for even Christ did not please himself. That's the point here. It's not that you don't have freedom. It's not that you can't enjoy your freedom. It's that your freedom's got to be subordinated to the law of love. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 real quick, and we'll look at a few ideas here that are pretty, pretty important as you grow. Now, religious people live by rules. Everything, something's right or something's wrong. God operates according to relationship. He looks at your motive for what you do and determines right or wrong. So, in, in, if you go over to your neighbor's house and shoot him, normally that's going to be considered murder. But... If he's breaking in your house, armed to harm you, and you shoot him, then, then you're actually doing the right thing, correct? It's all about situation. It's all about purpose. Why are you doing it? That's the issue between you and God. Why? I mean, you can do all kind of right things because you think works, as we said earlier, works will win his favor, it's not true. None of those things count. All that's going to burn up 
when you're working, working, working to get God's pleasure. So, God operates on for relationship. Now, let's read 1 Corinthians 8. Now, things about things sacrificed to idols. <laughs> and listen, he Paul's used sarcasm all the time. I believe this is sarcasm. We know that all we all have knowledge. He's talking to the Jews here. Knowledge makes us arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone thinks that he knows something, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Now here you got people, and I don't believe this is the Gnostic issue here yet. It's too, a little too early for that. But he's got people, Jews, who think they know. Oh, I'm, I know. I know the law. Blah, blah, blah. I'm really smart. Does that sound like anybody in this room? Do we think we're so special because we know so much? This it ain't what you know that makes you special. It's what you live. It's not what you've learned that makes you special. It's what you've learned and what you live out. You just learn it. You don't live it out. It makes you proud, arrogant. So, verse 4, Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. There is only one God. For even if there are so-called, he, he says, listen to the hypothetical, even if there were such a thing as gods. He said, yet for us, there's just, just one, the Father, from whom all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom all things have come into existence. However, in verse 7, not all men know this. Some being accustomed to, to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. In other words, they grew up eating this meat out of the temple because it was the only fresh meat available. You know, there were no refrigerators, freezers, so they either had to salt it or jerk it or to preserve it, so fresh meat was a delicacy, and it was much desired, and those that were able would buy it. And so they had grown up with this whole concept. So this meat was much desired. And before they were saved, there was no issue with them about the religious aspect. But after salvation, now they believe that if they eat the meat, somehow they're participating in the pagan religion. Paul said, nah. But many people still believe that. Why? They're immature. They haven't learned. They haven't grown. That's the point. Their conscience being weak, in other words, they don't understand, are defiled. But, but food will not commend us to God, neither for the worse if we don't eat it or the better if we do. But take care, and here's the liberty part, take care lest your liberty somehow becomes a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, who do, you understand the issue that an idol is nothing. They see you dining or eating in an idol temple. So they used it. it they, they would have banquets there. Uh, it, was a big, it was a big open space where people could congregate. Uh, if they see you in there eating... Their conscience, if it's weak, might be emboldened to eat these things sacrificed to idols. In other words, they see you, uh, uh, maybe a mature person in the church, and they see you in there, and they think, well, maybe it's okay for me. But in their heart, they still believe it's wrong. They still believe it's wrong. So, will his conscience be not emboldened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, hurt, damaged. The brother for whom say, who say Christ died. And thus by sinning against the brother. See, he says when you indulge yourself and you don't care who sees you and you don't take care of the weaker believer, that's a sin on your part. That's pretty strong. You say, look, I've got the freedom, I've got the liberty to use these things in my life. They're not sin. He says, but if you use your liberty indiscriminately, inappropriately, without care for who you're around or who is watching you or 
or care for younger, weaker believers, that's selfishness. That's, there's no love in that. There's no faith in that. Your faith is in the fact that you're going to just indulge yourself, not that you're worshiping the Lord or serving him in any way. So you've departed from the Lord and you just self-indulge it. Listen, husbands, listen, husbands. You want to just be yourself and act any way you want to do? Well, that's just how I feel. That's how, look, your self-indulgence is not part of your marriage vow. I've just learned this. I'm not going to tell you how. I'll make you guess. You just want to be yourself. You're like, I just want to be myself. What if yourself is a jackass like mine? I apologize for my language. I have the freedom to use that language, but see, now I'm on the Internet. How did I, who, did, who did I just offend? Who did I just lose as a, as a potential? See, I'm a perfect example of what not to be. But you get the point? God has sent us. We're, listen, we're, we're on a mission 24-7. Seven days a week, 24-7, you're on a mission. As a husband, as a father, as a witness, as a leader. Listen, we ought to be leaders. We go out to this new community out here, we ought to be leaders. See, our tendency is to go out there and go, well, we're just going to be, this is how we've always done it, just feed me. I'm going to sit there and get fed, and when it's over with, I'm going to fold everything up and go home. No, there's going to be some serving that needs to be done. There are going to be a lot more kids. We're going to have to have an education department. There's going to be all kinds of stuff that need to be done. People are going to be need to need to be people are going to be need to be invited to lunch. They're going to have questions. We meet hungry people. There's going to be a ministry that needs to take place to them. So this whole thing that we've got, listen, we've all just habituated the idea that this is all about me getting fed. And if I get fed, then boy, everything's great. If I don't get fed, then something's wrong. Listen, many of us, I've been here, I think, 36 years. If I'm not fed by now, I mean, it's time for me to give back. That's what I'm trying to say to us. So, love, liberty, li love... Let me, let me deal quite just real quickly. Paul says the weaker believer is the one whose conscience remained in bondage to false religious beliefs. Uh, and listen, that could be us. That could be anybody in here. You know, in Arkansas, I had a man, he was one of the great leaders of our church, had a grace oriented all the way, but when it came to alcohol, his grandfather, they'd had like a thousand acres or something, his grandfather had lost it all because he was a drunk. Lost the whole family wealth by being a drunk. He said, I'll never agree that, it's any, that there's any good that comes from touching that stuff. I said, well, I don't know, I'll fight you over that, but, you know, I can't argue that. But the weaker believer has, has religious ideas that hinder them from freedom, like alcohol, like language issues, for instance, cursing. Nothing good about cursing. You've, you're free to do it. You know, if you say darn, but you mean something else, God knows what you're saying. Oh, people that believe things that are not sins to be sin. They come, it becomes sin for them if they do it, though. Now, this is Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8. Now, the stronger believer is the one who's laid aside false ideas, learned, believed, and embraced the truth of the word. 1 Timothy 1, 5, it's a cleansed heart, which is a believer who is, pure, who is purifying their belief system by removing false ideas from it. A good conscience, it's an agathos conscience, it's divine good. The conscience is a mechanism that evaluates right and wrong in your life, and it uses the beliefs you've put in it. So you remove the religious beliefs and you instill and install divine truth beliefs in your conscience and it operates properly. You follow that? 
Listen, your conscience is going to give you, it's going to go off when you do something that goes against it. But if, you're, if you filled it up with gobbledygook, with religious stuff instead of truth, you're gonna, it's going to go off when it ought not go off. And it's not going to go off when it should go off. So, thirdly, the stronger believer is required to guard the expression of his liberties to avoid inappropriately influencing the weaker believer and causing them to violate their own conscience. The law of liberty is the freedom the believer has to enjoy the things of this life in moderation that religion often declares to be sinful. Food, drink, entertainment. Uh, there's an old joke about, anyway, I shouldn't go there. I've already messed it up, so anyway. Uh, you know, people have all kind of, when I was growing up dancing, my grandmother went to the Church of God, and she's dancing, playing cards. These were all sins. I'm like, I mean, I was not, I'd never even been to church, and that didn't make sense to me. Uh, the law of expediency is, says to do only that which is beneficial and edifies. Listen, that's my, that's my lesson. That's my lesson. I don't do a lot of evil stuff, but I often I just indulge myself in just being me rather than being on my mission. Being on my mission. And finally, the law of love, agape, is a mindset, an attitude in the heart that the Holy Spirit enables and develops that is a commitment to never for any reason or any circumstance to do harm and a commitment to always do good. It's a, it's a commitment. Listen, love, you know, we don't talk about the mechanics of it that much. We, you know, there's a very, very immature form of it where it just, uh, it's just, it's a feeling, it's a, it's a sense. But in maturity, love is a developed conclusion about the va God, how God values others. And because you, are, because you love him and want to serve him, you make a commitment within yourself that says, I will never say, do, cause harm to others. I will do nothing intentionally to cause harm, and I will only speak and say what I believe will edify. That's love. Paul tells us, it's really interesting, Colossians 12 through 14, 3, 12 through 14. So those who've been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against another, just as the Lord forgave you, so all should, so should you. And over all these virtues put on love, and listen, which binds all these other virtues together in perfect unity. This mindset that says, I will only, I will never do harm to you and I will only do good to you. All these other virtues, the fruits of the Spirit, oh, love, joy, patience, peace, kind, all these things, love uses all the different fruits of the Spirit, whatever's necessary, whatever's appropriate, whatever's needed at the moment, it brings it out. The Spirit does this. Listen, you just, may, you just agree with the mindset. I will never do harm. I will only do good. And the Spirit will enable you to be patient when you need to be. He'll, he'll remind you. He'll show you. Be patient. Be patient. All right. The last time I spoke, the clock quit. And I went over. This time, the clock is still running, and I've only gone over about two minutes, so. All right, listen, I just want to encourage you, I want to encourage you that to continue praying for our transition and to be aware that we're going to go where there's a bunch of babies because that's what we need to raise up some babies to carry on the message of grace the gospel and the message of grace to the next generation. Anything else? All right, let's pray. Let's pray. 
Yeah, we'll pray and then Rick do the flag. All right, Father. Uh, open a door for us, Father. Open a place for us to go and to minister and, and give us a heart to see a vision to understand where we're headed and why we're headed there and what our job is. To understand that we're, we're being called into service in a greater way than maybe ever before. And help us to be willing and excited and want that and need that to fulfill our life, Father. It's, it's the fulfillment. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.